Hello. In this video, we'll present medical case discussion with one of the candidates. In medical exam. Hello. Are you ready? Can we start the exam now? Yes, doctor. I am ready. We can start. A 38-year-old man presents at the emergency department with tarry stools and a feeling of lightheadedness. The patient indicates that over the past 24 hours he has had several bowel movements containing tarry colored stools and for the past 12 hours has felt lightheaded. His past medical and surgical history is unremarkable. The patient complains of frequent headaches caused by work-related stress for which he has been self-medicating with 6 to 8 tablets of ibuprofen a day for the past 2 weeks. He consumes 2 to 3 martinis per day and denies tobacco or illicit drug use. On examination, his temperature is 37.0 degrees Celsius, 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, pulse rate 105 beats per minute, supine, blood pressure 104 80ths of a millimeter Hg, and respiratory rate 22 breaths per minute. His vital signs upright are pulse 120 beats per minute and blood pressure 90 76 of a millimeter Hg. He is awake, cooperative, and pale. The cardiopulmonary examinations are unremarkable. His abdomen is mildly distended and mildly tender in the epigastrium. The rectal examination reveals melanotic stools but no masses in the vault. What is your initial diagnosis? Upper gastrointestinal tract hemorrhage. What is your next step? The first step in the treatment of patients with upper GI hemorrhage is intravenous fluid resuscitation. The etiology and severity of the bleeding dictate the intensity of therapy and predict the risk of further bleeding and or death. What is the best initial treatment? Best initial treatment. Prompt attention to the patient's airway, breathing, and circulation ABCs is mandatory for patients with acute upper GI hemorrhage. After attention to the ABCs, the patient is prepared for endoscopy to identify the etiology or source of the bleeding and possible endoscopic therapy to control hemorrhage. What is the Mallory Weiss tear? A proximal gastric mucosa tear following vigorous coughing, retching, or vomiting. The bleeding is generally self-limiting, mild, and amenable to supportive care and endoscopic management. What is the deal of war erosion? Infrequently encountered, this problem describes bleeding from an aberrant submucosal artery located in the stomach. This bleeding is frequently significant and requires prompt diagnosis by endoscopy followed by endoscopic or operative therapy. What is the arteriovenous malformation? A small mucosal lesion located along the GI tract. Bleeding is usually abrupt, but the rate of bleeding is usually slow and self-limiting. Define esophagitis. Mucosal erosions frequently resulting from gastroesophageal GE, reflux, infections, or medications. Patients most frequently present with occult bleeding, and treatment consists of correction or avoidance of the underlying causes. What is the esophageal VARICEAL bleeding? Engorged veins of the GE region, which may ulcerate and lead to massive hemorrhage, related to portal hypertension and cirrhosis. Define hehoragic shock. It is stages. Insufficient physiologic mechanism to adequately supply substrate to tissue. The American Trauma Life Support ATLS, system grades shock from stages I to IV. Stage 1, less than 750 ml blood loss, well compensated stage 2, 750 to 1500 ml blood loss, slight tachycardia, normal blood pressure stage 3, 1500 to 2000 ml blood loss, moderate tachycardia, hypertension stage IV, less than 2000 ml blood loss, marked tachycardia, prominent hypotension. How can you clinically approach and manage this case? Insufficient physiologic mechanism to adequately supply substrate to tissue. The American Trauma Life Support ATLS system grades shock from stages I to IV. Stage 1, less than 750 ml blood loss, well compensated stage 2, 750 to 1500 ml blood loss, slight tachycardia, normal blood pressure stage 3. 1500 to 2000 ml blood loss, moderate tachycardia, hypertension stage IV, less than 2000 ml blood loss, marked tachycardia, prominent hypotension. What else? Upper GI tract endoscopy establishes a diagnosis in more than 90% of cases and assesses the current activity of bleeding. It aids in directing therapy and predicts the risk of rebleeding. Furthermore, it allows for endoscopic therapy. Endoscopic hemostasis can be achieved through a variety of ways, including thermotherapy with a heater probe, 
multipolar or bipolar electrocoagulation, and ethanol or epinephrine injections. Endoscopy can demonstrate bleeding, esophageal varices, gastroduodenal bleeding, or no bleeding. For non-varicel bleeding, endoscopic hemostasis is usually achieved with the use of epinephrine injections followed by thermal therapy. Permanent hemostasis occurs in roughly 80% to 90% of patients. Once bleeding is controlled, long-term medical therapy with antiscretory agents such as histamine 2 blockers or PPIs is used to treat the underlying disease. Testing for Helicobacter pylori should be performed, and, if this organism is present, treatment should be initiated. Any NSAID use should be discontinued. If this is not possible, a prostaglandin analog, such as misoprostol, should be used or, alternatively, one of the selective COX-2 inhibitors could be used to replace non-selective COX inhibitors. When considering the use of COX-2 inhibitors, it is important to weigh the potential benefits of this treatment modality versus the possible cardiovascular side effects of this treatment regimen. What about proton pump inhibitors? Published clinical trials showed that non-varicel upper GI bleeders with high-risk endoscopic findings, high-risk locations, visible vessel, clot over visible vessel benefit from initial high-dose intravenous PPI treatment. This should be given as an equivalent of 80 mg omeprazole intravenous bolus, followed by an 8 mg per hour infusion for 72 hours. Patients with low-risk endoscopic findings, clean ulcer base, could be managed with high-dose oral PPI. Do you think that the endoscopic injection alone is effective? The effectiveness of endoscopic treatment has been assessed, and findings suggest that combination endoscopic modalities coagulation, clips, and injections appear to be more effective than endoscopic injections alone. What will you do if bleeding continues or recurs? Surgery or angiographic embolization may be necessary. Surgery is indicated for complicated peptic ulcer disease with massive, persistent, or recurrent upper GI tract hemorrhage in association with non-helling or giant ulcers greater than 3 cm. For a bleeding gastric ulcer where there is a concern for possible malignancy, either gastrectomy or excision of the ulcer is indicated. For other types of ulcers, the vessel may require ligation followed by a vargotomy procedure and pyloroplasty. The utility of surgery versus angiographic treatments has not been evaluated by randomized controlled trials, Therefore, it is unclear when one form of treatment is better than another. When considering the most appropriate approaches for patients, one must consider local resources, expertise, and the availability of these resources. Angiographic approach can diagnose and treat bleeding in roughly 70% of patients. Arterial embolization with gel foam, metal coil springs, or a clot can be used to control bleeding. In addition, Arterial vasopressin can cause bleeding to stop in some patients with peptic ulcer disease. 55-year-old man has undergone upper endoscopy. He is told by his gastroenterologist that although this disorder may cause anemia, it is unlikely to cause acute GI hemorrhage. Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? A. Gastric ulcer. B. Duodenal ulcer. C. Gastric erosions. D. Esophageal varices. E. Gastric cancer. The correct answer is E. Gastric cancer is relatively asymptomatic until late in its course. Weight loss and anorexia are the most common symptoms with this condition. Hematmesis is unusual, but anemia from chronic occult blood loss is common. A 32-year-old man comes to the emergency department with a history of vomiting, large amounts of bright red blood. Which of the following is the most appropriate first step in the treatment of this patient? A. Obtaining a history and performing a physical examination. B. Determining hemoglobin and hematocrit levels. C. Fluid resuscitation. D. Inserting a nasogastric tube. E. Performing urgent endoscopy. The correct answer is C. Fluid resuscitation is the first priority to maintain sufficient intravascular volume to perfuse vital organs. Assessment of volume status is best accomplished clinically. Acutely the hemoglobin and hematocrit levels do not fall and do not reflect volume depletion. A 65-year-old man is brought into the emergency department with acute upper GI hemorrhage. A nasogastric tube is placed with bright red fluid aspirated. After 30 minutes of saline flushes, the aspirate is clear. Which of the following is the most accurate statement regarding this patient's condition? A. He has approximately 20% chance of rebleed. B. 
the mortality for his condition is much lower today than 20 years ago. c. His age is a poor prognostic factor for rebleeding. d. Mesenteric ischemia is a likely cause of his condition. The correct answer is a. Approximately 20% of patients with acute upper GI hemorrhage have continued or rebleeding episodes. The mortality has remained the same, approximately 8% minus 10% over the past 20 years. A 52-year-old man with alcoholism and known cirrhosis comes into the emergency department with acute hematemesis. Bleeding esophageal varices are found during upper GI endoscopy. Which of the following is most likely to be effective treatment for this patient? A. Balloon tamponade of the esophagus. B. Triple antibiotic therapy. D. Misoprostol oral therapy. E. Endoscopic sclerotherapy. The correct answer is E. Endoscopic injection of sclerosing agents directly into the berry is effective in controlling acute hemorrhage caused by varicel bleeding in approximately 90% of cases. Balloon tamponade is a therapy used infrequently for acute esophageal varicel bleeding because of its limited effectiveness in achieving sustained control of bleeding. Other therapies include vasopressin or octreotide to decrease portal pressure. So the conclusion and learning lessons from this case. 1. Early endoscopy is useful in identifying the bleeding sources, and in patients with active ongoing bleeding it may help in achieving early control of bleeding. 2. Approximately 10% of patients who take daily NSAIDs develop an acute ulcer. Point 3. Surgery is indicated for complicated peptic ulcer disease with massive, persistent, or recurrent upper GI tract hemorrhage or in association with non-helling or giant ulcers greater than 3 cm. Point 4. Acute GI tract hemorrhage should be treated with aggressive fluid resuscitation, close monitoring of patient response, nasogastric tube insertion following resuscitation to determine whether bleeding is active, and gastric irrigation with room temperature water or saline until gastric aspirates are clear. 5. The most common cause of upper GI tract hemorrhage in a patient with cirrhosis and portal hypertension is variceal bleeding, which carries a high rate of mortality and risk of rebleeding. Point 6. The most common cause of pediatric significant upper GI tract hemorrhage is variceal bleeding from extrahepatic portal venous obstruction. So doctor, you're excellent and you passed this exam. Good luck. Thanks doctor. I am so happy. Thanks to you for watching this medical exam video. Hope you enjoy. Get benefits. We'll see you in more next videos. These videos for medical staff like medical students. Doctors. Undergraduate and postgraduate nurses so please subscribe to our youtube channel number one doctor like o videos share our video press alarm button to get notified about our new videos follow our accounts on social media in links below the video in the description with my best wishes doctor atef ahmed